And um, so all sorts of things are going on in the world today. The Lord's blessing in so many ways through medicine. And I've been telling you that I want to continually share with you things that are happening in the world that may point towards the fact that we may be in the end times. And, uh, of course, we had an election here uh, last night in Georgia. I don't know that that points towards in end times, but there was a big election in a very important country last week. And I don't know whether you noticed, but uh, France had an election. France is one of the probably one of the two leading countries of Europe. And we know from our study in Revelation, we're going to see more and more. Europe is going to be what? Europe's going to be the seat, the base of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to rule Europe. And so it's likely, maybe not a guarantee, but it's likely that France is going to have a major part in it. I take this magazine, I'm just about going to, I think I've decided not to take it anymore because there's some ink to Trump. But, <laughs> um, but The Economist is an English magazine that's just, it's really outstanding. It's one of the most... Uh, you know, distinguished uh, news and business magazines that it is in the world. And this is their latest edition. And it has a picture, and LJ is going to put it uh, when he gets a chance, uh, a good picture of Mr. Macron. There he is. At, he's, when he, he's just won the presidency of France. His name is Emmanuel, which is interesting. God with us. Uh, Emmanuel Macron. And uh, on here, on this magazine, it says, Europe's Savior with a question mark and it shows him walking on the water. Because Europe has got a lot of major issues. Of course, there's uh, terrible terrorism and France has just had a couple of terrorist events in the past two days. And there's just all sorts of things going on business-wise as things are really in the doldrums. And so they're saying, is this man the savior of Europe? You know, and uh, so what could be the case here potentially he might end up being, you know, who we don't know. He could be the Antichrist. Uh, uh, you know, I'm definitely not going to say that he is. We've talked about that he could be the president of Greece. He's another young man that's already made a, uh, a treaty with Israel. But this man is 39 years old. And it's interesting about him. He's sort of a little bit like President Obama in that he just sort of came out of nowhere. He had been the... Uh, e economics minister for the previous president that just went out of office. Uh, but now he started his own party, and this party didn't even exist a year ago, and he got 66% of the vote, and his party just won out an overwhelming majority of seats in their parliament, and it didn't even exist a year ago. <laughs> you know, so you just have to wonder, well, you know, when somebody comes out of almost out of nowhere, what's going on there. So we don't know what's going on with Mr. Macron, but uh, you know we may see him some more. I'm sure we'll see him uh, some more in uh, uh, world events, but uh, he may end up being somebody really, really important down the road, but we don't know. I'm not going to say he's definitely going to be the, the Antichrist, and I'm sure he wouldn't appreciate it if I said that either. But so um, let's look. I want us to do a little... Today we're going to do some new and we're going to do some review just to help everybody continue to remember. You know, Pastor Adam is always good to review what he has been doing up to the present. And so I want us to look just a little bit at some of the things that we have studied last time. But we're going to read the scripture concerning the church of Philadelphia, which is in chapter 3. And it is verses... 7 through 13, we're going to be reading in the Amplified Bible, which uh, LJ has put up on the screen if you want to follow there, or you can follow in your own Bible. And so beginning in verse 7, it says, And the angel, the messenger of the assembly of the church of Philadelphia, write, These are the words of the Holy One, the True One, He who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one shall open. Well, who is that, by the way? Who is Jesus, Jesus. He says, I know your record of works and what you're doing. See, I have set before you a door wide open which no one is able to shut. And that's talking about missions and, and evangelism. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and guarded my message and have not renounced or denied my name. Take note. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet 
and learn and acknowledge that I have loved you. And he says, because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance. In other words, you've held fast the lesson of my patience with the expectant endurance that I give you. I also will keep you safe from the hour of trial, the testing which is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. Well, just real quick, can anybody guess what that is? What's the hour of testing and trying that's coming on the world? The tribulation, exactly. So he's saying the church that is stayed close to him will be kept from that. So we can say if we think here that that's a sign that we're going to get raptured, those that believe and have in their heart uh, the Lord Jesus. He says, I am coming quickly. And another, um, many, many people say that that word actually usually really means I'm coming suddenly. I'm coming suddenly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may rob you and deprive you of your crown. He who overcomes, and we mention every time, that's the one word that's in every single one of the uh, seven letters to these seven churches. He who overcomes and is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He shall never be put out of it or go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which descends from my God out of heaven in my own new name. He who can hear, let him listen and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Amen. Well, we mentioned last week uh, that the church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia means what? Does anybody remember what, what, is, what does that mean in Greek? Brotherly love. Brotherly love, exactly. It's the city of brotherly love, and that was why our city, in fact, my wife is from Philadelphia. That's why our city has that name. It means the city of brotherly love. It's named after the city where this church is in Greece. And it was very much like the churches of Ephesus and Smyrna. It was, it was a good church. In fact, the Lord, as we just got through reading, He didn't have anything bad to say about this church, right? He had a lot of things to commend the church of Philadelphia with, but nothing bad to say. And um, we've also talked about how some churches, that all these churches come out of other churches. And we mentioned that Sardis that we studied last time, it had come out of the church of Thyatira. Well, Philadelphia comes out of Sardis. But Sardis really maybe is not quite the church that Philadelphia was. So what, and we mentioned this last week too, and as we studied before, what did the church of Sardis represent? You remember we were talking about how all of these old churches back in uh, Jesus' time and just after Jesus' time, um, these churches represent church ages. Now, which one does Sardis represent? Do you remember? The Reformation. The Reformation. The Reformation. Can anybody tell me what is an example of what happened with the church of the Reformation churches? Anything you can remember about what we talked about? Hopefully a few of these things are logging in our minds, you know. And one thing I'm, I'm going to just share with you as we go along, and I know I'm sure, I mean, Pastor Adam has his own thoughts, I'm sure, on these things, but, you know, one reason we preach and teach is for all of us to do what together? To, to learn together. And obviously not everything that's said can be remembered. We can't remember everything that's, that's said, but we're doing all this so that we can all grow together. And so... We need to, if you can, just kind of hold on to a few of these thoughts, especially the ones that we're kind of emphasizing so that they can become part of you and really help you in your life, I think. Uh, so the one about the Reformation, <clears throat> the Reformation was what? That was when Martin Luther came in to the big church that had existed for so long, and he, led by the Holy Spirit, began the Reformation, began the, began the Protestant movement we would be in a different situation if he hadn't come and done the good things that he did. And do you remember some of the things we talked about that he did? He believed that every person should be able to read the Bible. See, that was not the case. I'll just tell you a little story. My mother was a good Bible teacher. Uh, she, I don't know if she didn't. My mother was a very unique person. She was a hermit. <laughs> she, by her own definition, she never, she just didn't like to go anywhere. And uh, but so she would go to church sometimes, but she was the best teacher at our church. And our church was right down the street from where Pastor Adam grew up. Um, 
she was just a great Bible teacher, very knowledgeable, and uh, she uh, was asked by one of the ladies on our street, why don't you start a Bible study on our street? And so she said, well, sure, I'd like to do that. Well, one of her close friends down the street happened to be of this big church that we're talking about. I'm trying not to name it because I don't want to, I'm not trying to be unkind. So, uh, but it's a really, really big church that's got over a billion members, if that'll help you. And so this lady, now this was in the, in the 80s, this lady said to mother, oh, I would love to come to your Bible study, but she said, we're, we're not allowed to do that. She said, we can't just go and, she said, we can't read the Bible ourselves. Said only the person that leads our church can teach us, and we're not allowed to just open the Bible and read it. And I thought to myself, thank God for Martin Luther, you know, because every one of us in this room owe him a debt of gratitude because he is the one, and he was many times uh, almost put to death for this. He was hunted his whole life uh, by the big church <laughs> uh, because of, of beliefs like this, but he believed in everybody being able to read the word and he really you know had a good conception of what the word meant and, and he taught the word very well but we talked about how the reformation church just didn't quite go far enough maybe and so the church then that philadelphia represents the one that is still going on today is the church that did go all the way that went far enough and went and got involved in missions and got involved in powerful teaching and the Spirit of God came on people. And we talked about last week the missionary movement. And when did the missionary movement begin? Does anybody remember who was the first missionary that uh, ever existed? Now, this is not something you have to know, obviously, but it's just something good to know about this. Now, William Carey was an Englishman, and he was a cobbler. He, he made shoes for a living. And he, in, because of what Luther and others had done, he started reading the Bible himself, and he believed what it said. It said, go ye into all the world and minister. So here is this English cobbler that didn't have much money, and all of a sudden he reads the Bible, he believes it, and the next thing you know, he is in India. He went to India, and he became what we consider the first modern missionary, and this was in 1793. And so with him, the, what's called the faith missionary movement began. And the Lord said, see, I have placed before you an open door. And he believed that. And so people, we mentioned people like Adoniram Judson, David Livingston. You've heard the famous term where somebody in Africa was, uh, Mr. Stanley was going. He was an explorer in Africa. And he came to this man and he said, Dr. Livingston, I presume. He had been hunting for him. And it was David Livingston, the famous missionary. And there was a man named Jonathan Demuth. No, Goforth was his last name. And he was a famous missionary. Jonathan Goforth. That's a great name for a missionary. Demuth is too. And um, there, of course, had been thousands, even millions of people going to Africa, China, Japan, Korea, India, where all over the world. Do you, do you remember we talked about, too, America for so many years was the largest sender of missionaries, and sadly now, it's not who's number one. Does anybody remember? Argentina? South Korea. Oh. South Korea probably has <laughs> more uh, Christians per capita maybe than any country on earth. What country, by the way, probably has more Christians in it than any nation in the world? China. China. Very good. China, no doubt. Uh, they've got most of them, many of them, most of them are underground, but China, a communist nation, uh, and it's if you ask its president, uh, how many Christians are in your country? You know, he'd probably say next to none. He's hoping there's next to none, but there supposedly are over a hundred million Christians in China. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? So China's number number one in numbers. South Korea's number one in sending missionaries. Who's number two in sending missionaries? Argentina. Argentina. Very good. Very good. Uh, and then we're now what? Number three. Number three. You know, one reason I was just. Uh, I'm uh, on the board of a, uh, an organization that sends missionaries down in Mobile, and we were down there talking about how a lot of American missions organizations are bringing their people home, and the reason is, is lawsuits. Now, can you imagine, we've got so many attorneys, I hope no, there's not an attorney in our room tonight, but uh, we've got so many attorneys and they're suing 
people so much. So like if something happens to somebody on the mission field, they're suing the denomination uh, for like an illness or whatever might happen to them. So they're starting to bring their missionaries home. And that sounds bad, but you know, and I want to just talk about this because this is really important for us. How many of you are familiar with indigenous missionaries? This is something I've really been a big fan of and supporter for years. What an indigenous missionary is, is simply somebody from the country that they are a missionary in. For instance, there is such a thing as an American indigenous missionary. That's an American serving in the United States. The fellow that we support, Pastor Jensen, is an indigenous missionary to India. He's an Indian and he's serving in India. What's good about that? Well, if you talk to Pastor Jensen, um, you know, a pastor in India can live on about, oh, probably three or four hundred dollars a year. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? Do uh, you know how much the average American missionary requires? If they, let's say, if they went to India or if they went to Kenya or someplace, how much does it cost a year for on average for an American missionary? Hundred and twenty-five thousand. So it's very expensive, and they, they have to spend a lot of time raising money. Whereas, in like an Indian missionary, you know, four hundred dollars will do them for the whole year. If they need a motorbike, you know, maybe a little bit more. And uh, so. so being an indigenous missionary, also you know the language, you know the culture, you know everything. You start off running, you start on the ground running instead of going like our folks have to learn the language. They've got to learn, you know, what to say and what not to say. Um, you know, there's all sorts of like you know hand gestures that we use over here that are good, but if you use them in another country, <laughs> you know, you can get in trouble. Are certain words you say? Or, you know, like in an Arab country, you never eat with your left hand. I won't say why, but you don't. And um, there are just all sorts of things that you, you have to learn. You cannot, you, you just cannot do certain things or it's very offensive to people. So um, they don't have to worry about that. They already know what to do and they just hit the ground running. And that's one reason they're having so much success. We talked about, uh, do you remember how many uh, charismatic and Pentecostals there are worldwide? As I remember, it's about seven to eight hundred million adults. That doesn't count children and teens. So really over a billion people in charismatics. And one reason for that is because indigenous missionaries are just hit the ground running. And you know one thing that happens with a lot of the Pentecostals and charismatics is they believe the word. <coughs> So they get saved, and a lot of times the pastor is the one that's been saved the longest. Because you, in a village, you'll just get, the whole village gets saved, and maybe the pastor's been saved six weeks, and everybody else has been saved four or five weeks. And so they, he becomes the pastor because he's been saved six weeks. And so he reads the Bible, and like Martin Luther taught, he just believes it, what it says, and so he believes in the gifts of the Spirit, he believes in speaking in tongues, he believes in all these things, and he just jumps right in there, and so does the whole town. And so that's why in just a hundred years, the Pentecostals and Charismatics now have really over a billion members, more than any other group in the world. And it's increasing rapidly. In fact, they say by the year 2020, that 90% of salvations will be occurring worldwide in Pentecostal and Charismatic churches. And that's something in that. So, uh, you know, the Lord is doing a great thing. And much of that, by the way, is through indigenous missionaries. And so we talk about a revival. And then all of this is, we'll, we'll get into the exact points in the scripture in just a second. But there's a revival that's supposed to go on in the last days. And people say, you know, Americans keep saying, well, we keep waiting for it. You know, when is it going to break out? And, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to in our country. I hope it will. It hasn't yet, has it? And I'm hoping it will. But there's a revival that's been going on for decades all over the world. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. In China, we just talked about 100 million people saved in China. In Africa, there are hundreds of millions of Christians in South America, there's a huge revival going on right now. In um, in India, it's uh, going on, and it's it's really under the cover too. It's they have to be very quiet there about what they're doing. Um, 
I think I told you that Pastor Jensen, anytime it's it's law in India, anytime a person gets saved in India, they have to sign a form stating that this was their choice, the person that got saved, that the preacher didn't have anything to do with it, the church didn't have anything to do with it, but I made this decision on my own to convert to Christianity. The pastor has to then sign that form and they have to make an appointment with the mayor and they have to go meet with the mayor and tell him that this is what has happened and the mayor has to sign the form and the mayor makes a copy of it and it goes in that person's file in the city hall and then the person gets a copy and the church gets a copy because if the church had done it, if the church had gotten him saved, then the church would be shut down. And so all that they have to do things like that all the time in India. And I want to say one more thing about Pastor Jensen, who is really our our missionary, so to speak, that we're supporting through our church. And a couple of people have mentioned to me, they say, said, oh, did you go over there when you were in India recently? Uh, were you with that little fellow that was here? Or was that that, uh, one, one person, that, that funny looking fellow with a purple coat? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, well, yes, it, it was him. But let me just tell you just a little bit about, about him to help you. Because I want us all to always be praying. I, I hope you'll put it, his name on your refrigerator or wherever you might want to put your, your prayer request. Because Pastor Jensen is really... A mighty man of God. He has, there are 135 churches under him. And out of that number, there's over 100,000 people that he then ministers to in one way or another. Not only that, he's the head of an organization that has 800 bishops in it all across that area. And he's got a leper colony and he's got a home for women who, when they become a, a Christian, and they admit it in some towns, they kick them out of the town and they have to go into hiding. And so he's got a home for these women and he's got a Bible college, he's got an orphanage. So and he is a mighty man of God and we need to be praying for him and, and just praying the Lord will give him mercy. You know, he, he has had his churches burned down. Even his big church got burned down a few years back. And some of the people, even one of the pastors that I went to see, you know, they've been beaten up. And so we need to be praying that their their doors will still be open to them and that they'll be protected and safe and, and be able to, to move forward with the Word of God. So those are some things that we're looking at as we talk about the Church of Philadelphia because it is a the church that represents the missionary movement. And two factors that led to the great missionary movement, we just mentioned one was the printing of the Bible in the language of the people so they could read it. And then they read it and they said, oh my goodness, it says in here, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So they just said, well, the Lord told us to do that. I guess I better do it. And they went and did it. So as, as simple as that sounds, that was a big deal back in the 16, 17, 1800s. And so that's one of the two factors that led to the missionary movement. The second factor was an increased study in the doctrine of end times or of the Lord coming back again. That had not been studied for many, many centuries, uh, not since about the three or 400 years after uh, Jesus was alive on the earth. People had just kind of forgotten about that. So once it started being studied again, that's when people started saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, if the Lord's coming back soon, we better get to work. Uh, if it's possible that the Lord is coming in the near future, we better start winning souls because he may come uh, come today. So uh, um, that's one thing that we've noticed has happened in recent years. In fact, our denomination, and I would say it's sister denomination, the Assembly of God that I used to be in, both were founded uh, based on the fact that they believed the Lord was coming back soon. Um, they believed, uh, one of the main founding tenets was that they believed that Jesus was coming back soon and we better get out there. And that's one reason they've been so successful because they have put it right to be at the forefront of their thinking that we need to uh, win, the, win the world before the Lord comes back again. Um, as you notice, let's move on a little bit further. Does anybody have any questions, by the way? I always like to ask any thoughts or any questions before we move on? 
Um, as we noted in reading the letter to Philadelphia, um, it reveals several aspects of Jesus' nature. The first one is holy, uh, that the Lord reminds the church of His holiness, and He noted that the church of Philadelphia was holy. It was separated from the world into holiness. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be holy because I am holy. Also, the, one, the second thing of Christ's nature that is revealed is that He is true and that He is truth. Uh, truth being meaning here genuine, uh, even with the added note of perfection and completeness, and that Jesus is the true bread, uh, as talked about in John 6, 32 through 35. So Christ is the truth, He is the ultimate truth. Um, also, we see here that is concerning that about Philadelphia, they are separated from the world doctrinally. Not only are they separated into holiness from an unholy world, but they knew their doctrine. You remember we've been talking about how the Bible talks about how we need to know our doctrine, and we're going to be talking about that more and more in the in the future. But Paul was all about knowing doctrine and. Uh, so they were separated doctrinally and believed the doctrine that had been laid down by Paul and by the Lord. Well, the third thing we see of Christ's nature revealed is that he is the one who holds the key of David. And that means he controls the extent of what kings and princes and governors and presidents can do. He holds the keys uh, of, of David in his hands, so we see the might of the Lord and how he, you know, puts uh, leaders in place, and uh, uh, so another mighty aspect of the Lord there, that he holds the key of David, the authority of Christ being seen there. Also, the fourth thing is that it says, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Uh, this is talking about the preaching of the good news. Meaning if the Lord opens a door for you or for a country, nobody's going to be able to shut it. The Lord wants us out there serving Him, winning the lost. And so no one can close a door that can be shut. Do you remember what I talked about uh, last time with the pastor that had the uh-huh? And I'm trying to rem I want to remind you of this so you can make sure and remember because it really is, is very important for us. What does that mean? Does anybody remember the story of the pastor that had the uh-huh from the Holy Spirit? To speak to someone about Jesus. All right. Exactly. If the Lord, in other words, this particular, he was a good friend of mine. I used to go to Kenya with him. And when he would be out, the Lord would say in his spirit, uh-huh, when he walked by somebody. And that meant, okay, he's somebody I need to minister to I need to lead this person to the Lord and you remember I told you the story about the huge football player in the Tampa airport that looked mad as fire and he walked by him once and uh, he got the uh-huh from the Holy Ghost and that's how the Holy Spirit spoke to him he speaks to us all differently right I mean he never said uh-huh to me but he he will do different things to different ones of us but he got the uh -huh as he walked by this huge six foot seven linebacker from for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He recognized his face, and he was had an angry face. And he was sitting there in the middle of this huge airport full of people. And uh, the Lord said, "Uh huh." And he said to the Lord, "Surely not. <laughs> you know, I, not not really. I, I probably just misheard." And he was going to get himself a drink, and so he went and got the drink, and he stayed a long time, hoping maybe that the guy's flight would leave or that, the, he, that his spirit would clear up. He comes back, and he sees the man there, and the man's staring at the floor, and uh, he walks by him, and just as he walked by him, the uh-huh came back in his spirit. So he turned to him, and he said, Son, he said, the Lord wants you to become part of his kingdom the Lord loves you and he Jesus died for you and he wants to save your soul and so what did this six foot seven angry uh, black linebacker with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers do he fell to his knees and burst into tears in front of probably a thousand people in this airport and said preacher that's what I have to have tell me how to get saved and so uh, George my friend George led him 
to salvation there. So my point in just reminding us of that is here we're talking about a church that was actively involved in evangelism. And we need to be too because time is short. And we also don't know how long we've got on the earth, right? I mean, we don't know how many days we've got left on this earth. I mean, ourselves, you know, the Lord may not come for a while or he may come soon. Um, but we don't know how long we've gotten, so we're called. How many of us in this room are called to do the work of an evangelist, by the way? Got one, two, three. <laughs> all of us, all of us are called, right? And so we all need to, to be, get sensitive in our spirits to that uh-huh. It may not be uh-huh, it may be something else. And it may not be, you know, for Miss Doris, you know, it may be just picking up the phone. Or it may be, you know, writing a note to somebody. You know, it might not be that we're going to be out, you know, in an airport somewhere. We might, or we might be in Walmart, or we might be in Florida. Well, who knows where we will be? But it might be, you know, we're going to find ourselves in many pla places. You know, Walmart, Kmart, wherever. And um, we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. How many times? I'm going to just ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Just, just think about it, because I can unfortunately say yes is how many times have you ever been somewhere and you felt like the Holy Spirit was telling you to minister to somebody and you and you didn't do it. You know, you just felt like it wasn't well you know you just didn't want to or you were in a hurry or oh they're gonna get mad at me or oh this is a public place and it's gonna embarrass them. You know, I I almost uh, weep tears when I think about and I wonder if the Lord's not going to just briefly remind us of that before we go into our reward of times we've missed you know um, Charles Stanley believes that that's going to happen but uh, it won't last long but goodness you know we need to make sure we're listening right and that we're ready to, to act on the things that uh, we need to Phoebe I mentioned last week she knows her time is short at her company and so she's getting bolder and bolder by the day and telling me stuff she's doing i'm going wow that's, that's amazing be careful <laughs> and uh, and so uh, she's just trusting the lord to cover her and um, and also I, I i remind us of this too again ee -E, just very quick uh, evangelism explosion you remember what we've talked about that it's just a simple thing, and you may not ever end up using it, but then again, it sure is a handy thing to know. And that is, when you're with somebody, ask them if the Lord leads you. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? And based on what they say, you can really tell whether they're a believer or not. And if they say they're going to heaven, you can always follow it up with what makes you think so, or what, what is, what's the reason that you're going to heaven and if they say something like I've always been a good person I heard somebody say this by the way on TV just this last week and they said I know I'm going to heaven I've always been a good person I've always gone to church and we know that doesn't do it does it so um, we need to be more and more aggressive about being evangelists for the Lord um, let's look uh, just a little bit further Christ commends the church at Philadelphia in several different ways. He says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And so we know that one of the chief characteristics of faithful service through the church age that we're talking about is, is evangelism. And uh, 1 Corinthians 69 mentions that Paul considered an open door an opportunity for Christian service. He also, the first thing then was, I know your deeds. I've placed before you an open door. The second is you have a little strength, meaning they might have been a smaller congregation. They were a minority where they lived. But Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. And this church was strong, and it lasted for 1,400 years until the Turks came and took over everything and turned everything into Islam. So it was a powerful church that lasted a long, long time. The third thing, the third commendation he gave him is, yet you have kept my word. So this church importantly not only believed the word, but it also obeyed it. And you know, that's something I think the Lord is expecting of all of us. It's one thing to, I've heard people, heard preachers talk about people that will sit and soak. Uh, and you know, they'll come and they're always there and always learning and always listening. 
But then we're called also to go into action, aren't we? So not just to sit and soak, but to be, be aggressive and do things that the Lord would have us do. So the Church of Philadelphia was obedient to His Word. So the Reformation churches that we talked about, they believed, but they weren't as obedient. But the church age that Philadelphia represents was obedient and carried out His Word. Another kind of, a common commendation, not condemnation, but commendation is, uh, the fourth one is that they have not denied my name. And Satan is always trying to get people in different groups to deny the word of the Lord and to deny the Lord, but they stood true to him. Um, you remember we talked about the girl who was, she was an Armenian and uh, her area got taken over by Muslims and she got branded. So they, they went to her about five times. And she was a teenage girl, 14 years old. And they said, do you choose Christianity? Or, will you, or do you choose Jesus or Muhammad? And she says, Jesus. And finally, the fifth time, they said, we'll give you one last chance. Are you for Jesus or Muhammad? And this young girl said, I stand for Jesus. And they took a big branding iron and branded her shoulders. There's this thing about that big that said Jesus on it, interestingly. And uh, just almost killed her because it got infected and so forth. And uh, but, but she was found by an aid agency many years ago. And so she's an example of somebody that did not deny the name of God. Now we don't have to worry about that in this country right now. I hope we don't ever have to. But how can we deny the Lord? You know, maybe are we in McDonald's that Shane is running and doing a great job with, and we've just ordered uh, uh, meal number three, and we're sitting down to eat it, and we just chomp right in there. What have we done? Have we denied the Lord if we don't do what? Say the say grace before it. And that doesn't mean an excedrin headache grace either. You know what that is? That's like, you know, sit there and you just kind of, kind of do like, you know, sort of like you're just rubbing your head and you get a headache and then, and then you start eating because you don't want anybody to think that you're praying. You just, you know, get this headache. Oh, Lord, bless this or a quick one. Uh, it, means, it means that we take a little time and really everybody in there sees and knows what we're doing, right? And uh, that we don't have a headache and that we, uh, we're really genuinely thanking the Lord and everybody can see us. Can anybody think of anything else? How can we... How can we show people that we're servants of the Lord as opposed to denying Him? You know, one thing I like that Georgia does, and some other states do it too, is they allow, let you put on your license plate. Uh, I think, what does Georgia have in, in God we trust that you can put on there? That's a nice thing to do. I'm not saying everybody has to do that. But you can put a Jesus, you can put a fish on there, or you can put something like that. And everybody that sees that car will know that you're, you know, at least saying you believe in the Lord. And some other states have done the same thing. Is there anything else we can do? What else can we but do? if you do that, yeah. please obey the speed limit. You're right. Please <laughs> not That's be good. rude when you drive. <laughs> I know. Right? I know. That, that reminds me of the famous uh, event of where somebody had a honk if you love Jesus uh, bumper sticker on them and, and somebody honked and they got out and chewed them out. That wasn't too good. So you're right. We do have to act right if we have, have that on our license plate but just let the lord show you if there are other things that we can do to show people out in the world that we're serious that we really love the lord and we're really serious about yes suzanne when brian cutshaw was here um, last year we went to the class that he taught the next day up in iowa and he was talking about how he's been doing that and saying this, and I know our pastor is a retired waiter uh, from his early days, but did you know, this, he's just a tired waiter, 
Yeah. Did you know that, I mean, and I'm quite serious about this, it is a well-known fact that Christians are renowned for being the worst kippers yeah. that there are. And of that group, preachers perhaps have even a worse uh, reputation. So, one way we can overcome that is when we're out, make sure that we're kind, right? We leave folks a tip. Because there's some restaurants where the um, the waiter and the waitress uh, don't make very much money at all. I mean, like their their salary is very tiny and they're, they're, they live on their tips. And so when a Christian goes and doesn't tip them or leaves a penny or <laughs> a quarter or a nickel or something, you know, that really hurts them financially and it doesn't do much for our... Um, ourselves either so that's another way we can show the Lord's uh, love to others is through you know fair kidding um, anything else anybody can think of uh, yes sir uh, I'm bad for wearing uh, Christian uh, yes Shirts and T-shirts that uh, have something about the Lord on them uh, draws people to you to ask about it, and, and is a good witness. And so is for saying the, the blessing. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's let's move on uh, quickly as as we come near to our closing tonight. Um, Christ also, the Lord had several promises to this commendable church, this wonderful church. Uh, one is vindication. Remember we read, he said, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be the Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Different people think this means different variations of, of, of the same thing, I think. But to me, what this shows is the persecuted church, which they were, who stood true to the Lord, they're going to be vindicated in the time of, of our reward. And I think, for instance, uh, I always think about the Christians in Pakistan that I've read about. And I know somebody that has been to Pakistan and ministered to them. Do you know they put Christians in Pakistan, for the most part, most of them live, they make them live around the sewer plants of every town and of every uh, city. And of course they have the monsoon rains that come there and you can kind of guess what happens and the Muslims intend for this to happen when it rains a whole lot and it starts flooding. Guess what comes up into their houses, you know, and it gets about two feet deep and that happens multiple times a year and they have to live there. The other place they let them live is in, it talks about in the Old Testament, Gehenna, which was, is the garbage dump. Uh, they make them live out in the garbage dump where they burn the garbage. And so they have all their houses out, their huts and houses all sit out in the garbage dump. And of course, the law in Pakistan is if a Muslim uh, ever accuses a Christian of anything, they're automatically taken to court and you're sitting in front of a Muslim court. And a lot of them, of course, get put in prison or worse, they can be put to death if they say you blasphemed Mohammed. And all I have to do is just say it. And it's their word, it's the word of a Muslim against the word of a Christian, so you can guess how that works out. Um, but there's a lady that I've been praying for in our church up in Illinois, and many other people have been praying for her for many, many years, named Asia Bibi. And she has been in prison now for 10 years. She's been on death row because she ministered her, her she worked with several ladies, uh, and they asked her, why are you so joyful all the time? And so she shared with them very briefly about Jesus, and one of them told on her, because that's illegal to talk about Jesus like that. 
So they arrested her and they tried her and they put her on a death row. She's lived in an eight by 10 cell. Now for 10 years, she hasn't seen her girls grow up. She hasn't seen her husband in many years. And so here she is on death row, but the Lord lets her know that he loves her. He sends a bird to her, a little bird, every day at the same time, and it's been happening for 10 years. And she knows that bird is from the Lord, and it comes and it chirps in her cell. And, and uh, she also knows that there are over a million people that have signed letters, written letters to the government of Pakistan about her. So she knows that people love her. But it's been tough. But she is going to be vindicated, the Lord says, on the day that she goes to heaven. And people will have to bow down at her feet, those that accused her, and said that she was wrong, you know, that she shouldn't be lifting up the word of the Lord. So she's an example of somebody uh, like maybe many of the people that lived in the Philadelphia church that will be vindicated someday. Also, the second thing he says, you will be preserved. He says, since you have kept my command to endure patient, patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. And the world has never known a universal period of uh, torture like this. So what we can take away from this verse is that uh, this is one of the verses we can believe that shows that there will be a rapture, that the church will be raptured. And we're all hoping and trusting that that will be the case, that we'll be raptured and go to heaven uh, before the seven-year period of tribula tribulation occurs. And we'll be talking about that at a future time. But... Uh, Definitely, you know, Matthew 24, 21 said, talks about the time when there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. So we know that time has not happened yet. There's not ever been a, a, a time where the world was put under so much difficulty as it will be uh, during the tribulation period. And we know that's going to happen when the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel for seven years. So that's... You know, many people are expecting the rapture to happen any time because a lot, most people that have been watching prophecy believe that there's not really much else left that has to happen before uh, the Lord comes to gather us in the air. So we need to be ready. That's one thing we can all say. We've got to be ready for when the Lord... Because where it says, I'm coming suddenly, I'm coming soon, I'm coming suddenly in the twinkling of an eye... It'll just happen, you know, and, it, and, and we'll be caught up. And, of course, it'll be a time of great joy, but we need to prepare, you know, before, before he comes. Okay, what was Christ's counsel to this church? He says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that nobody will take your crown. So, in other words, keep, keep at it and keep holding strong. And even in our world, you know, we don't have to worry about getting tortured or, or sent to prison for being a Christian. But we have so many things that can pull our minds off of loving the Lord, don't we? I mean, just we're bombarded by it. So we need to keep the world from stealing our love of the Lord, you know, from letting them do it. I mean, they can't uh, do it, you know, without us letting them. But we need to be strong in the Lord. And, you know, here at this church, I praise the Lord. You know, we believe in evangelism, in Bible teaching, in missions. And those are three of the things that the church at Philadelphia believed in. Um, I was just reading a little blurb about, uh, many of you probably heard of Dr. Adrian Rogers, the pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the head of Southern Baptist Convention, very well-known preacher. He preaches to two services of each of 7,000 people on Sunday morning. And he is a big believer in evangelism and in preaching the Word of God and also in preaching the end times. And so uh, I think those three things together, which we're bringing forth here too, tend to ignite uh, a church even more. And uh, so praise the Lord. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I was just reading too uh, as we close the nation of the Netherlands, which was used to be one of the great mission-sending uh, nations of the world and sent forth the, and even many denominations that were powerful were started there. I just read recently that 60% of their people say they've never even set foot in a church. And they expect as more and more people are born, that's going to very soon go up to about 72%. Think about that, never even set foot in a church in a country that used to be 
sold out really for the Lord. So we see this happening in many countries all over the world, but we thank the Lord that there the the most of the third world countries and even a lot of areas in this country are, you know, staying true to the Philadelphia church. I was going to say this real quick, um, just as we close. Uh, do you know that the southern United States is the only place in the entire Western world that has been majority Christian for the past 400 years? I've sometimes thought that uh, the southeastern United States is maybe one reason that the Lord hadn't come and destroyed the world so soon. Now that sounds kind of... Uh, bragging on our, our area too much, but you know, a lot of people, Hollywood throws off on the south, and northerners sometimes do too. I used to live in the north. and But the southeast is the only place in the whole western world. Europe has for many, many, many decades been in a post-Christian age. The north has, in the United States has been in post-Christian age. So has the west than in a post-Christian age. That doesn't mean there are not many believers in those different areas, but they're not the majority. So praise the Lord, you know, that the Southeast has continued the work of the Philadelphia Church, and we can praise God for that. So just as we finish right now, these are the last things. Christ has a challenge for us as well as for the church at Philadelphia. Number one, he says, He who overcomes, I will make a, temp a pillar in the temple of my Lord. Never again will he leave it. So what is a pillar? A pillar represents stability, uh, uh, something that can be buffeted but is strong. So the Lord is telling us, I'm going to make you strong when you go to heaven. You're going to be a pillar in my temple. And I will make you, make you strong and, and unshakable when you are, are in, in heaven with me. Number two, he says, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And we know that the seal of the name of God is going to go uh, on the believer. Um, just very, very quickly, and we'll talk about this at a later time, but we want to mention that heaven is going to be so special. Heaven is described how big it is. And it is a cube. It's a big city. And it's a cube and it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And it's that third 1,500 miles that's so amazing. So in other words, it goes from roughly, let's say, New York down to Miami, roughly. And then it goes from the East Coast all the way, say, to St. Louis. And you say, well, that's, you know, that's a pretty big area, but that doesn't seem like that's big enough to hold all the believers through all the centuries. But it's that third measurement. It's 1,500 miles high. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But that's enough to have about 600 different floors in it. 1,500 miles high. I mean, 600 huge floors. Like, when I say floors, not like a floor that we would know like this, but a, a ground to sky floor. It can be 600 of them. So it would be like that many different countries almost that are that big so it's going to be amazing it's going to be beautiful it's going to be wonderful we're going to be active we're going to have a wonderful life that we're going to talk about in a few weeks but that's what he's telling the church at philadelphia and telling us today too third he says and i will write on him my new name so we will have the name of christ the name of god and the name of christ it says in revelation 22 3 through 4 uh, that uh, this name entitles us to be his servants and that we will always see the Lord's face and we'll be with him forever. And so when we get into heaven, uh, into the study of heaven, you're just going to be so joyful because we're not just going to be floating on clouds and doing nothing and it's not going to be boring. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be more wonderful beyond your wildest imaginings. And we're going to have a fun time talking about that and what is in store for us all. So, so any comments before we close in prayer? All right, let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you for what you have in store for us. And thank you for this wonderful church of Philadelphia that did so many wonderful things that we are still experiencing here in this church as well as many churches in America as well as all these churches that are blossoming all around the world in this end times that we live in. 
Lord, thank you that we live in such an exciting time. Help us to, to focus on you more and more every day as we know the time of our drawing near to you is getting close. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to be like the pastor in Florida that we talked about. And when we hear the uh-huh or whatever it is that you quicken our spirits about uh, any individual that we come in contact with, that Lord, that we'll answer, that we'll be responsive to the Holy Spirit, that we'll be tuned in, that we'll listen to what the Holy Spirit tells us to do to minister to people that you place in our path, or maybe you place us in their path. And so, Lord, we just pray together right now that you will use this church, this church as a mighty body of evangelism in this area, and also, Lord, as we pray for our brothers and sisters over in India and in other areas of this world, but the Indians that we you've placed in our path to support financially and to minister through and to help us to pray for them and lift them up daily. Lord, help us just to be in tune with you and drawing closer to you every day in our spirit and in our heart. And so, Lord, thank you as we <clears throat> take a little time this week and go back and just read and remember and recall and recollect what we've talked about, about this wonderful church at Philadelphia, that you'll bring it back to our memory and that we will not only be joyful about it, but we will put the things they did in effect in our lives as well. So, Lord, we give you all glory and honor and praise. We pray a special blessing to be over every person here. Lord, we pray a hedge of protection to be over everybody here and all of the folks that come here and attend this church. Put angels on guard round about each person as we go out and, and are out in the world and, and doing your will. And we pray that likewise for the children uh, that are next door and the youth. And Lord, we also, as we close right now, finally, we pray for all the churches in this county, our brothers and sisters that are in all these 68 churches in this county. Lord, we pray that you will bring revival to every one of them, that you will cause them to just have a hungering that they've never, ever had before for you, Lord, for your word and to, for your kingdom and to go out and do your will. We pray that for ourselves here and for all of our sister churches. And we just give you glory and honor and praise for all that you're doing in our lives. And we all said together in the name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.